Hi class, this is Professor Adamson. We're at lecture three, I think. This is still um, under unit one. Now, um, we're gonna talk really quickly about just what is the field of audiology and what it takes to become an audiologist. These slides you can still find within the um, very first PowerPoint that is in, um, that is under Blackboard. I think it starts with slide nine out of 44, but I'll, I'll show you the relevant slides as it takes. As, it, as the case may be. So what is audiology? You know, I have been an audiologist for 10 years now, and I still sometimes struggle in explaining to my friends and family what it is that I do. But um, I guess probably the most basic explanation one can give for what does it mean to be an audiologist or what is an audiologist is that I'm someone who diagnoses and rehabilitates hearing loss, okay? Um, I guess a kind of good analog for an audiologist is maybe an optometrist. So a medical doctor that deals with ear issues is called an otologist or an ear, nose, and throat doctor. Sometimes it's called an otorhinolaryngologist. That's a really long word. Oto, rhino, laryngo, ear, nose, throat, okay? Or sometimes just otologist, ear. But uh, ear and hearing specialist is, is an audiologist. Similarly, a medical doctor that deals with eye issues would be an ophthalmologist, but somebody that deals with vision loss, um, diagnosing and rehabil rehabilitating vision loss would be an optometrist, right? Somebody that you go to to get your glasses for, right? So audiologists, you know, a little bit, you could, you could say that we're a little bit the hearing analog of an optometrist, okay? So um, mostly audiologists deal with ears and hearing, but we also deal with dizziness and balance because the inner ear... Um, isn't just the cochlea. We have five organs of balance within the inner ear. We have the three semicircular canals, which you guys have probably seen in pictures, and we also have two other um, organs called the utricle and the saccule. That's all located in the dense bone right here, the temporal bone. The entire inner ear makes up the organs of hearing, the cochlea, and the organs of balance, the five organs that I just mentioned. Those two sets of organs join together to create one cranial nerve, cranial nerve number eight, the vestibulocochlear nerve, that then goes to the brainstem and delivers information on hearing and balance to the brain. I do not really know why evolutionarily we have our ears, um, kind of our inner ear that is coded both for balance and for hearing, but it's just kind of the way that it is. But if you think about it, we rely on our hearing, but also our vision kind of to keep us, you know, balanced and proprioception, et cetera, et cetera, to keep us kind of um, uh, in space, making sure that we don't fall over and all that sort of thing. But we'll get into that later, okay? So a little bit more about audiology. I'm just going to go forward here. I'm going to move my phone and kind of show you the computer screen here. So... What is audiology? To become an audiologist nowadays, you need to have a doctorate. So believe it or not, you can't just get a master's degree anymore um, to be an audiologist. You have to go through four years of post-baccalaureate training, meaning that you get your um, master, so you get your bachelor's degree and then apply for audiology programs. And four years later, you get a doctorate. So it's not a bad deal in the sense that you only have to go to four years of school post baccalaureate to get a doctoral degree um but it you know it is it is a lot of school you know four years of undergrad and then another four years of of graduate school but you don't have to go to school ever again if you don't want to which is nice um compare that to speech language pathologists on the other hand where i think you guys have two full years of school and then one full year of uh your cfy the the clinical fellowship year in audiology, we have three full years of school and then one year of clinical fellowship. Um, the difference, though, with that is I think with speech-language pathologists, you guys can get paid because technically I think after your two years of training, you actually have your degree, and then you do that third year to kind of get your certification, okay? Whereas in audiology, you do not have your degree yet, so you may not get paid for that fourth year. So it's an entire year of essentially working, depending on where you go, maybe for free, okay? Okay. Some other things that you need to do in order to become an audiologist, you have to get um, clinically certified by ASHA, the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association. Um, that's if you want to supervise students and if you want to teach. Um, most places require you to have what are called your C's. You guys may know that as the CCC SLP that you see behind some of the professor's names that you have. Um, in audiology, it's CCCA. Sometimes I feel like my, my name is Peter Adamson. 
comma AUD comma CCCA. But um, once you have your C's, that allows you to um, supervise and teach. Okay. Um, one other thing that we as audiologists have to do is uh, maintain state certification, state licensure, that is. So to practice in New York State, and that's true for speech language pathology too, um, you have to take the praxis, praxis exam and then also um, become uh, licensed by the state that you wish to practice in. Now, keep in mind, a lot of people here in New York, you know, practice in New Jersey, live in New York, practice maybe in New York. I've got a colleague actually that sits right over there, right next to me, um, Dr. Urbina. She's both dual certified as a speech language pathologist and an audiologist, and she has to maintain, um, and she does work in New Jersey as well, so she has to maintain multiple licenses in multiple states um, with multiple different um, careers. And one other thing we have to do is, is, is CEUs, which are continuing education credits. So just because you're done with school doesn't mean that you stop learning. You do, I think, have to maintain about 30 hours for every three years, which isn't too bad, about 10 hours of continuing ed a year. That's, um, that really isn't that bad. This course, for example, when all is said and done, should be 45 credit hours, contact hours, so you can kind of do the math there. You'll want to make sure to take advantage of all the free opportunities that you have because some of these CEUs, this continuing education credits can be a little bit expensive. So look for free ones when you can and look for ones that you're interested in, that is. Um, there are options for doing other things within audiology that don't require an entire um, four-year degree program. Um, but if you do get the Doctor of Audiology degree, that's considered to be AU period D period. So Doctor of Audiology, you know, go figure, it's AUD. Um, after you get your AUD, um, sorry, I'm keeping up here on the slideshow. Oh, before I, I, I was, went down a different track. Um, some other options that you have for audiology that don't involve getting your AUD, you can become a hearing aid dispenser, which is generally called a hearing instrument specialist. That's somebody that just works with dispensing hearing aids, and, and you can actually... Um, go into the field of, of getting, you know, into private practice of dispensing hearing aids. You don't have to do nearly as much training as an audiologist, but as you might guess, it doesn't pay quite as well. I think you just have to have an associate's degree to do that. So like two years of, of post-high school work. You still have to get licensure and so forth. If you do dispense hearing aids in New York State, even as an audiologist, you have to get a separate license for that. So it is a little bit annoying when you've got working in multiple states and multiple jobs. You have to do multiple checks that you're writing to the state every year to maintain licensure. So it's important to keep up with that stuff. You can also be a hearing screener. And I've had students do this, and I did it myself when I was a student. Um, babies that are born in New York State, really, that are born anywhere, need to be screened, meaning that we um, put what are called otoacoustic emissions into the baby's ear right after they're born, well, usually about 12 hours after birth, 12 to 24 hours, to see if the baby's hearing normally. And it's a screening. It doesn't really tell us anything diagnostically other than the baby doesn't need any more testing or the baby seems to be hearing more or less fine, okay? If you have any interest in that, you can let me know or just, I guess, talk to any hospital that you live nearby directly because they need hearing screeners all the time. The hours are not great. I remember when I was a hearing screener at Beth Israel, I had to be there, I think, at 3.30 in the morning. You know, it, was, it was good for a student's schedule, but it may not be ideal for a schedule for those of you who have children, etc. Okay, so some other things about audiology. So it's a relatively new field. There's a reason why a lot of people don't know about it because it just hasn't been around that long. In fact, audiology has not existed as a profession um, unique until the 1940s. We're on, I think, slide 12 now. Now, what happened in the 1940s? World War II happened in the 1940s. I'm sure you guys probably know this, but I'm always surprised that there are some students that don't. World War II happened kind of recently in terms of history. There are people alive right now that remember World War II. That means that the very kind of founders of this field, the people who've been around since the beginning, could potentially still be alive. We only have a few generations of audiologists out there. So that may be part of the reason why a lot of people don't know about it yet. Now, you might ask yourself, why is the field new? I mean, people have had hearing issues for much longer than just um, since World War II. You have to remember that ear and hearing issues, especially as it came to hearing aids, 
were sort of deemed to be part of a disability. Um, it, it basically it was the way that society sort of looked at disabilities, particularly about disabilities when it came to hearing loss. Prior to the 1940s, we sort of saw hearing loss as being falling into one of two categories. You were either old and kind of on your way out, or you were either born deaf and kind of shipped off to a different school and dealt with differently. We really had kind of a misunderstanding of hearing loss. We thought hearing loss was kind of something that happened to people on either end of the spectrum, and there were people kind of to take care of that stuff, like old people issues and deaf people issues, and it really didn't have anything to do with those of us who heard quote-unquote normally. Now, of course, I don't think that, but I'm just describing to you kind of what what the societal perception of of, of hearing loss was. Now, I'm going to use some terms here that I don't really like, but I'm just going to kind of put it out there. People saw hearing loss as either part of being old and just you're going to be old and you're going to die soon, so who cares about them? Or you were part of the deaf and dumb community, so go put them at a different school and teach them some other language. Like I said, that's not how I feel necessarily, but that's just kind of where society was at that time. Now, what happened with World War II? For the first time, we had young men and some women, but mostly men, coming back from war with hearing loss. The nature of war changed. We had a lot of people coming back as veterans that survived the war, but were wounded. So for the first time, because of the way technology changed, we had veterans of foreign wars coming back with hearing loss. So the veterans associations, the veterans administrations, I should say, the, um, the government agencies that are responsible for providing health care for veterans, saw that there was this whole new field out there. People, young men, were coming back with hearing loss. We needed to develop an entire field for people to rehabilitate them. We had people sort of for the first time that we deemed to be valuable and important members of society, and I hate to put it that way, that's kind of just the way society thought of things, as being rehabilitatable. These were not the deaf and the dumb children, and these were not old people on their way out. These were still young men in their early 20s that needed some help. The Veterans Administration put forward this entire field of specialists to kind of train and, and track and, and diagnose and rehabilitate those hearing losses. And it went so well that they moved that entire field to the civilian population. So for the first time, we had an entire new field out there, the field of audiology. Okay. Um, let's see. What else do we want to talk about? Now, some other things that I, I, I want to talk about audiology, I guess, just very generally here. This is one of the big strengths of the field, I think. Um, I am actually relatively new to the field of audiology. As I said, I've only been teaching, I'm sorry, I've only been in the field for about 10 years, since 2010. Prior to that, I worked for many, many years in college student services. I worked at NYU. I worked at Hunter College. I worked at a school in the Midwest called Ball State University. I worked at Truman State University in the Midwest and Missouri. Um, my undergrad degree is in counseling psych, or counseling, I'm sorry, psychology, and then my master's degree is in, is in counseling psychology. So for years and years, I worked in college student services doing like Greek life and residence life and college student counseling. I did a lot of college student activities, um, pretty much the non-academic side of college student life. Um, I really liked it, but as I got through my 20s, I started to realize that most of the problems that my students were having were kind of really specific to 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds, like people coming to me over and over again, oh, my, my girlfriend won't call me back, and oh, my boyfriend didn't wash the dishes, and my roommate was mean to me, you know, these sorts of things. And after a while, I, you know, just kind of was like, gosh, I'm having a really a lot of trouble <laughs> relating to this. I, I remember this moment. It was at Hunter College, and it was around 2004, 2005, when a student... Um, came into my office with some complaint about, you know, something that 18-year-olds deal with. And I remember just having a smile on my face, but just thinking, like, I just don't care. I don't care. <laughs> you know, come back to me when you've got an eating disorder or, you know, you've been, you know, assaulted or something, some real problem, and then we'll talk and we'll deal with that. But I was having a real hard time kind of meeting that student where she was at with that issue. So with that, I realized that the field of kind of psychology and counseling was way too soft science. I needed to find something that kind of was a helping profession, but was based on something real, was based on something kind of 
something that you could point at, something that you could, that you could say was real. Audiology, in that way, is a really good field for people that need about 50% of the time to be kind of soft science, kind of the helping professions, um, social work, that sort of thing. But then about 50% scientist, where you're looking at data, where you're looking at science, where you're looking at numbers. Audiology, much like physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language pathology is like this to some degree, does a good job of putting those two things together. I love that about audiology. I love that I can be 50% social worker and 50% scientist. Doctors, medical doctors, you know, and nurses, I guess, are kind of leaning more towards the science side, right? They're not, you know, nurses maybe less so, but doctors, it's not really, you know, doctors, some doctors have good bedside, what they call bedside manner, but that's not really what doctors care about. They really care about being the best diagnost diagnosticians. That, if that's even a word. I think I just coined it. Being the best researchers, being the best scientists that they can be. The social work stuff, that's not really for them. That's why sometimes, you know, maybe you butt heads with doctors because they seem like they're not maybe as kind or as nice as they should be. And in doctors' minds are like, it's not my job to be kind or nice. It's my job to diagnose the job correctly. Now, I'm not saying that it's an audiologist's audiologist job to be kind or nice, but it's a little bit our job to work with someone and process those feelings that they have about hearing and ear and hearing issues and hearing loss and helping them navigate that, okay? So if you're somebody like me, like I had a very hard time finding my niche. Um, it wasn't really until I found audiology. I'm, I'm somebody, and maybe this resonates with some of you, I'm somebody that I like, I, I like a little bit of a lot of things, and I feel like I'm a little bit good at a lot of different things, but I'm not a lot good at any one thing, if that makes sense. If you feel like you're one of those people, that really has a lot of interest in a lot of different things, but maybe can't really focus on any one thing at a time, consider some of these fields. Consider physical therapy. Consider occupational therapy. Consider audiology, speech language pathology, things like that. Because as I said, they kind of do a nice job of marrying together 50% the people side of work and 50% the science side of work. I would not like doing all of both of those things, I'm sorry, all of either one of those things all the time. If I had to just do science all the time, I wouldn't really like it. I would miss the people aspect. If I had to just do people all the time, I'm not sure I would care for that either, as evidenced by my work um, with college students. So if that stuff resonates with you, um, you know, you've, you're in the right place, okay? So what does an audiologist do? I'm going to flip this back up to the computer. Um, assessing hearing and balance function, evaluating and fitting hearing aids and other amplification devices, and uh, implementing in the rehabilitation of hearing and balance function. Now, when you hear the word rehabilitation, we are talking about relearning a skill that already once was learned. Now, that's different than habilitation. A lot of what speech language pathologists do is you're helping kids learn something that they've never learned before, how to pronounce words correctly, how to resonate the, the vowels correctly within their vocal tract, how to articulate exactly. You know, all of those things are things that the child hasn't learned yet, so therefore it's a habilitation issue. Hearing loss, on the other hand, because the patient at one point did know how to hear normally and now isn't anymore, it's helping them get back to the place of being able to hear what, you know, their brain would more or less perceive as normally, okay? So that's the distinction between habilitation and rehabilitation. Um, there's lots of things within our scope of practice to do. Um, I'm not going to bore you with all of those things now. Audiologists, for the most part, compared to speech-language pathologists, we spend a lot more time working in medical facilities. Speech-language pathologists, on the other hand, spend a lot more time working in schools. Now, there are obviously speech-language pathologists that work in hospitals and audiologists that work in schools, but the jobs, you know, where are they? If the idea of working in a school is more appealing to you, Speech language pathology may be the track that you want to go to. If the idea of working in a healthcare facility or hospital is more appealing to you, audiology may be more the field um, for you. Okay? So that's it for this video. We're going to do another one on acoustics and then another one on um, anatomy, physiology of the outer 
middle and inner ear, okay? That'll wrap up for unit one and wrap up, I think, for the first two weeks, but I wanted to get this posted before too much more time went by. Thank you, class. You guys are doing great so far. Get me those 10 things.